So you're just, you're, you're into the hip hop thing. You're doing music, you're a teenager, you're advancing your fishing knowledge just because you love it. Yeah. You're a fish head. Yeah. Right? And the, the one stumbling block that, or I, I shouldn't say it like a stumbling block, but the, the thing that all young men encounter at this time yeah. is the opposite sex. Absolutely. Girls. Yeah. Girls get in there and... Um, and boy, that becomes a primary focus for a lot of guys. I guess I guess this is the time when uh, this probably happened for you. Oh yeah, oh yeah. There's always, I think, when you get to your mid-teens, there's always that female distraction. And you know, for us, it was even more so. Uh, you know, we we don't we don't drive till you're, you're 17. So here we are, 13, 14, 15, and we're Jones to go fishing, and we still have to get our moms to drive us to the lake. And I vividly remember, you know, you know directing them where to park. No, 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 don't park here. This is too much on the main road. Park over there in that parking lot, you know, and we'd, we'd gather up our rods, you know. We only have one rod at that time, our little tackle sack, and, you know, looking, okay, make a break for it. Go, go, you know. Like, very conscious of not wanting to be seen fishing, primarily because of the opposite sex, you know. You gotta remember, growing up in New Jersey, suburb of Philadelphia, Besides that core group of four guys, no one else fished. The thousands of people that lived in these towns around Philadelphia. We didn't know anybody else that fished our age, uh, you know? And because of that, there was a stigma. It was all self-imposed, you know, of course, that, oh man, you know, you gotta be a country bumpkin or you gotta be an old dude to fish and fishing's uncool. And so to be cool, we tried to hide it. Um, and that all changed. But it was something we had to work through, <laughs> at least through high school. That's pretty. That's pretty. <laughs> in, that's pretty interesting. Now that you say that, I remember. That, I remember yeah. feeling that exact same yeah. way. You know. Yeah. You would tell. You tell the girls you're doing something else. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. got to go away this weekend. You know, for something. Yeah. And you'd go fishing. And actually, I can tell you, I remember the moment that changed for me, and it was, uh, it was my senior year in high school, and I had a, um, I had a public speaking class which at the time for me was, was a tough thing, uh, you know. Believe it or not, relatively shy, you know, growing up in, in middle school and high school. And I had this public speaking course, and part of, the, assi part of the, the course assignment was to present something in front of the class. And oh God, I was dreading it for weeks. You know, what do I do, what do I do? And you know, doing mock, st staging mock demonstrations at home. You know, what could I do, I could, you know maybe do this or maybe do that or you know how I tape a hockey stick or all these things and I'm like and I kept getting back to wanting to do something and fishing remember now we're in we're at, we're at the late 80s here still you know this isn't this isn't nowadays and I came up with this plan that I was gonna fillet a fish in school and so I brought in I'm not kidding this is a true story I brought in this crappie that I had caught you know a good pound and a half crappie in tin foil, stuck it in my locker with this big like 12 inch blade fillet knife. Can you imagine doing this now, having this in your locker in high school? And uh, came up with this plan and I did this elaborate seminar in front of the class where I filleted this fish. And I was so proud of it and I was, I was drawn to it because I was good at it and I've learned how to do it from my uncle and my grandfather. And that was kind of the moment where after I got through it, People will come up and be like, that was amazing. And, oh, I didn't know you fished. And, you know, there was this almost coming out of the closet moment for me with that as a senior. And that was a turning point for me, you know. And, uh, and that really kind of led, I think, to letting go a, a little bit. And, you know, saying, man, this is something I love to do, passionate about it. It's okay. It's okay for, for girls to know that. It's okay for other people to know what I love to do, you know? That's good. Yeah. That's interesting that, uh, that's so you're at high school, right? You're graduate, you're a senior in high school. You're, you know, still into the hip hop scene, pretty hardcore. Yeah. And um, what, are you, what are you doing now? I mean, you have options, like all young men. Yeah. College, military, yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, getting into a, a different field, a, yeah. you know, a blue collar field, you know. Yeah. Uh, what 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 did what'd you decide to do? Yeah. So you know, high school for me was uh, not how I would 
want to go back and teach my kids how to do it. Through all that stuff, the music and the break dancing and the girls and the skateboarding and the fishing, uh, I was not a great student. And it, it was because of effort, you know? I look back on it now as an adult, and I'm like, what an idiot I was. Uh, but I wasn't a great student. And uh, so, you know, I didn't have a plan when I graduated. My plan was to go get a job. And, and uh, the year after I graduated, I went and got a job at a shipping and receiving company. Uh, with one of my friends, one of my fishing friends. And, you know, we had this plan that, man, they paid great money and we're going to go work for this company. We're going to make all this money. And it was the worst, crappiest, nastiest job ever. But it was the best job I ever had in my life. Because after six months of that, we didn't want anything to do <laughs> with being involved in that business. And, and it, it was a reality call for me, a wake-up call that... And educate more education was something I wanted to do and that was an important thing I think you know a lot of people realize that in middle school and in high school they start thinking about that it took me a little bit it took me a year after I graduated to realize that uh, but, but six, six months of shipping and receiving six months of shipping and receiving at Accumark and what and was that what was the, the, I'm curious what was that job like you that, said it was horrible it was hard well it, it it was a shipping and receiving job, which isn't bad within itself, but uh, you know, you're know, you really the low man on the totem pole, and it's a lot of manual labor, uh, strange hours, uh, you know, dirty, you know. I think the thing that got me, and I, I vividly remember this too, is about four, four or five months in, being in the break room, because you know, when you worked eight hours at, at shipping and receiving, you, your break was gold. And I remember having lunch with Brian, and there was this guy there that we used to call Edgar A. Hairbomb because his, his hair looked like one of the monkey's hair, but like all exploded every time it was in different directions. And you know, we sat there and had lunch with him and he was like, man, you guys are doing good, you know, just keep working, you know, he's like, this is my 10th year. And you know, now I'm, I've moved up to assistant shift manager, you know? And I think that was at the moment where I'm like, ah, this isn't for me, man. I gotta figure something else out in life, you know? Uh, but it was a great thing. It was a great thing because, you know, for me, it was the moment where I said, I, I, want, I want to do other things. And this whole time, now keep in mind now, now we're graduating high school, this whole time, now the tournament things are becoming more reality. I'm still subscribing to Bassmasters. Now I'm getting, uh, you know, in, in Fisherman and Field and Stream and all these other publications. And I'm starting to see that, you know, fishing professional fishing is something that it's a long shot but maybe maybe I want to try this you know and uh, and college is a big part of that so you know for me it was going to a community college and getting to a point where I could get into a good college which which wasn't a bad thing financially it was a good thing at the time um, but at that same time so now we're at 1991 making the big decision to go back to college, to go to Canham County Community College, to work on a degree, to get to a better college. At that same time, I made a conscious decision to tournament fish. I wanted to try this thing that I've been reading about. And I kind of discovered that I could do it at home. It's amazing that up to that point, I always saw tournament fishing as something that was far away, done in the South, this national event that I could not never touch. And all of a sudden now I said, well, wait a minute, there's local tournaments. There's, you know, 20 boat tournaments with John boats. And, uh, and that was the next step for me. And I um, can vividly remember finding a um, flyer at Fish and Fur, which was a local tackle store <laughs> not far from where I lived. And that was our haven, man. There, were no, there was no internet back then. The only big story you had was Bass Pro, and it was all mail order catalog, and that was great. But fish and fur, you could walk in there and touch stuff. And, oh, look at that. And what is it, you know? And it was that whole thing, getting back to my pop's box again. And um, I walked out, of at the checkout line at fish and fur, and I saw this flyer. And it said, public buddy tournament, Manico Sand Ponds, $50 to enter. Oh, God, $50. Oh. You know, but somehow talked my buddy Brian into, you know, come on, man, let's let's get let's just let's just do it. Let's get the money. Let's try this, man. You know, let's do it. We've been to Manico. You know, we catch them. 
And, and that was the start of it. And fish that first tournament, remember, I didn't catch one. <laughs> didn't even catch a fish. I think it was uh, a 20 to 25 boat tournament. There was maybe five guys that caught him good and the rest caught one or none. It was, you know, an early spring tough tournament on Manico. Um, but even, even with that, you think, well, that's the end of it. You know, I realized that I stink and I can't compete, but I want it more, you know? And I think that was part competitor in me coming out. And I think it was part wanting to get better at figuring out the puzzle. And again, getting back to that theory of that's why I fish. You know, wanting to get better at solving that puzzle. And in a tournament situation, solving it quick. That's cool. Interesting. Your first tournament was the same place I had my first tournament. How on. about that? <laughs> wow, I didn't know that. That's crazy. Springtime tournament? Uh, I No, it was in the summertime. Summertime It was tournament. after graduation. Okay. It was in the summertime. Gotcha. Well, also with a college buddy. Cool. But, um, so you're fishing your first tournament. Yeah. And uh, at Mananico, you got... You got it handed to you. Yes. You know, but it that that often, you know, you find out who you're made of then. Yeah. You know, like you, it's either going to motivate you or kick you into yeah. the dirt. Yeah. And so it, it seemed like it motivated you. It did. And, and you know, I think uh, in other parts of my life, I think failure is a very good thing, you know. So in breakdancing, when I couldn't do a move, man, I'd practice for hours in, in the basement on a piece of cardboard <laughs> trying to trying to master these moves and I'd have a mirror I put on the ground hours and weeks and months and then then you'd figure it out and you'd be like oh my god I can do a 1990 I can spin on my hand same thing in fishing you know motivated me that failure was a great thing for me because I wanted to get better um, you know and I, I think that led to the next super super critical stage for me which was we left that event both of us determined to do better in a tournament but also, all of a sudden we realized, there's this thing called bass clubs. And we're like, wow, I didn't know that. There, there are actual clubs of guys that get together to talk and share knowledge, but to compete. And that was the next big part for us was to join a club. And um, you know, it went on this search that we wanted to find this club that we felt like we fit into. So we looked through the Federation programs and None of us had big boats. We all had John boats. In fact, my John boat was my high school graduation present. When I graduated in 1990, you know, uh, the rich kids were getting cars and uh, other kids were getting money towards their scholarships. None of that was there. What, what did I want? I wanted a boat. So I got a used Coleman Crawl Dad, which was this polyurethane canoe looking boat that I still have, by the way. Uh, and it was the best graduation present ever. And, but, but again, it led to the next step. You know, we fished that first club tournament and now we wanted to join a club. But what we found out is all these clubs, or most of them, were big boat clubs. And we could join as a rider or we could do this crazy other thing, which would be to start our own club. To start our own bass affiliated chapter and become a small boat club. So that's what we did. So we got the guys together, that original group, still that original group. It was myself, Brian Stockel, Dave Brodzik, Tom Hernishan, John McGraw. Uh-oh, you need six guys to start a bass affiliation. So we scrambled, we got, you know, we came up, we have everything. We have the name, we came up with this name called Top Rod Bassmasters. We knew where we were gonna meet. My mom worked at the municipal building. They would let us have the hall for, uh, once a month for two hours. We had all this plan, except we we're missing a guy. So we, we thought, we sat, we thought, and we remember this one guy from high school that fished like one or two times with us, held the spinning reel upside down, didn't really fish, and we called him up, and we got him to agree to send us the subscription money to Bass to be our sixth member. And, uh, and that was the start of the club for me. And, and it was awesome. It was awesome because it, it brought us together. New members came in over the course of the next couple years with new information. A guy from Tennessee joined and brought stuff that he was doing there. A school teacher from Swedesboro joined that brought stuff that he was doing in South Jersey for years that we didn't know about. And all of a sudden now, it became this group where we would get together and just throw ideas and share ideas. And 
fish two tournaments a month on these places. And that was important, I think, for the bigger picture of where I'm at now competing, which is all those little things you don't think about. Time management, that's where I learned it, Top Rod Bassmasters. Decision making, that's where I learned it, Top Rod Bassmasters. Uh, you know, when to go left, when to go right, um, how to call, how to keep fish alive. All these little things at the professional level now you almost take for granted. I learned all that in, in the club level. Really interesting to look back on that. What, now, you got humbled in your first time out of the gate. Yeah. What, what, what was your first experience in the winter circle? Like, you know, uh, having some success. Yeah. How, where did that, and when did that happen? Yeah, that came in the, at the club. Uh, my first success at the, the a money tournament, buddy tournament level, open events, still didn't come for years. I still ended up fishing a few without very much success. But in the club, I started having success. And that drove me to the next level. And I started to figure out things I could do to make myself better. You know, everybody had their own thing. We had Brian, who with a slider worm, was could not be beat. And we had Dave, who was the first guy to fish a, a baitcaster when he was like, you know, 12 years old. And he was a power fishing guy. And we had all these guys that had their certain little clicks. John McGraw, a popper, that was his deal. But I started to figure out if I could learn how to do a little bit of all of those, it would make me better over the course of seven or eight tournaments. I started to figure out that these guys would just show up and start tying baits on right at the ramp in the morning and wouldn't do any thought. But if I strategized before, so I'd started thinking about buying maps. There was this book called the New Jersey Lake Survey Guide that I got at Fishing Fur and it had very rudimentary topo maps on it. And if I did a little map study and I started to come up with a game plan and I did my tackle the night before the tournament, I started seeing my success get better and better. So, you know, at the time I wasn't doing it on purpose, but looking back on it, I was carving the niche of who I am today as an angler. I was figuring out how I fish, how I tournament fish back then. Uh, super important stage. Even before that, we missed this, but I want to talk about it from 12, 13 years old till I was in this club, 18, 19 years old. That's a lot of years, that's six, seven, eight years there. And then during that time, I was sub unconsciously learning to fish new baits every year. And I was doing it with the whole year, or let me say the whole summer to do it. Man, I look back on that and I think, God, can you imagine having that much time now to learn a technique. So I started with that 9S Rapala, and that's all I knew how to fish. And then I remember next for me was a grub, was a Mr. Twister grub. And I spent like a whole year with that. Still fished the Rapala, but I, I learned it, how to fish it on a jig head, the technique, slow roll, what to fish in here. And then the next year I learned about this thing called a plastic worm. And then the next year was a spinner bait, a crank bait, a top. And it was that progression, it seemed like each year, subconsciously, not on purpose, I would learn a new bait. And I had that whole summer to learn. Can you freaking imagine having that kind of time to learn? Uh, you know, again, it, it, looking back on it, none of that was done on purpose. I didn't say, you know, I'm gonna be a pro angler and I need to do this. It was just happened. I just loved it. I loved uncovering new pieces of the puzzle. Uh, but looking back on it, that was, that was key. What a great way to, you know, tell a, a, a young person to learn a learn a technique, you know, is to concentrate on something yep. like that. Yeah. So well, I wish we had BU TV back then. It would have been an easier <laughs> process. <laughs> the, uh, blink, blink. <laughs>